Um, I think we're going to get started uh, with a lot of respect for the people who did, the, who've turned up here on time. So thank you, Pallavi. Thank you, Ricky. Um, ask us many, many questions because I'm sure the people who will be getting the recording would really be interested in knowing more about uh, what we're talking about today. So um, I'm going to just skip out house rules here today. You both are already on mute. If you have any questions, uh, just ask questions not to everyone, uh, just to the keynote women speakers uh, in particular in the chat group. Uh, but more preferably, just unmute yourself and have a chat with us so you don't need to really throw the question in there. So I thought I would start off today by really kind of uh, contextualizing as to what I understand this, this uh, session to be, So, which I will do with the help of a very short story. For all of you who know me, what a surprise that I'm using a story to lead. Um, so there's this day when there are three people who are sitting on a table and uh, there are two ladies and a gentleman on the table. And this is a real incident that took place. Um, and these two ladies are looking at this painting and really admiring the painting. And one of the ladies says to the other lady, uh, oh my God, do you know this guy, this young painter who's painted this, he's learned all of this all by himself, which is really evident to them because of the way the hands in the painting are drawn. They're not artistically drawn. So there's a little bit of kind of, you know, not as perfect as it should be, uh, through which they have come to know that he has learned it all by himself. Um, so Gotha, who is a very famous German writer, was a very famous German writer, is also on this table. He listens to these two ladies and he says um, that you should not praise, you should blame for that this person has learned everything himself. And the two ladies are kind of a little bit shocked and they're going, what do you mean? Why should we blame? And his response is that a man and a woman or a woman of talent never decides to foolishly learn everything by themselves, but look up to people who already have done the hard yards of knowing something that is going to become important to us tomorrow. So Pallavi and Ricky, you're a man and a woman of talent who have come here today to learn from people who already know and have done hard yards with the blended workforce, and you are learning from the brilliant brains that we have here. So I want to congratulate you for making that decision. Thank you for making time. Um, my name, both of you know, is Anjali, and I'm uh, the Managing Director of Narrative, the Business of Stories, but my job today is really to elicit stories from these three brilliant minds that we have on the topic of the blended workforce. So I'm going to quickly introduce them to you. Um, I had a real trouble really shortening their uh, introductions. They have done way too much in life. Um, so uh, I have picked the ones that I thought of would be of interest to you, although they have a extremely elaborate and large and lovely profile, but I'll only say a little bit about them because um, what their amazing selves you will witness as they speak. So first, Annie, Annie, can you just wait to us um, because industry with Citrix as APJ head of talent acquisition and diversity outreach after more than a decade of um, uh, in healthcare life sciences. Her past experience includes working regionally with GSK, um, Pearl, Pearl Life Sciences, Eric Lee H. Harrison. But today's Annie's, uh, Annie will throw light on the role of HR in blended workforce revolution. So she's gonna focus on the role of HR in the blended workforce revolution that is going to take place very, very soon. Um, on a personal note, note, the part that I love the most, uh, Annie volunteers a school counselor at Singapore Polytechnic and is an active career mentor at Singapore Institute of Management and supports prime time professional women's association. She is a, listen to this, she is a grassroots leader at Telok Blanga constituency. It gives her immense satisfaction to mentor and develop people to be successful. Thank you for your time, Annie. Um, our next speaker, all the way from Barbados. I feel like I'm in this Miss Universe contest because that's where you hear our next contestant. Uh, but here, Rochelle is a qualified and published HR professional consultant and speaker. Through her PhD, Rochelle has worked with multinational companies from several countries. In addition to her independent consulting, she's a senior lecturer in HRM at the University of the West of England, as well as senior consultant at global consulting firm 
Performance Works International. Rochelle is also the founder and principal partner of Crowd Potential Consulting Group and delivers specialist workshops and interactive training, interactive training sessions. Rochelle's true passion lies in applying good people management practices within the growing digital economy. And she recently, I should say pre-COVID times, spent five weeks traveling across Thailand, um, a remote working hotspot to explore co-working spaces and interview globally dispersed workers. So you can understand the amount of knowledge and wisdom that she has gained through that experience. Today, through her session, Rochelle will throw a light on new human capital management framework called Gig HR, which helps organizations and individuals in digital spaces navigate relationships in the new world of work when she isn't working you can find her in the gym swimming pool tennis court cycling through english countryside or trying her hand at some new diy project which currently happens to be her gardening project i checked that out on instagram welcome rochelle can you just wave us hi okay so there's rochelle for you Last but not the least, the man I have had the privilege to learn a lot from already, Jeremy, is the Chief Executive Officer of Performance Works International, a company that helps organizations, executive boards, leaders, and teams succeed in the digital climate amidst disruption, opportunity, and uncertainty. Jeremy commands extensive experience as a transformation leader and advisor at the board level globally. Jeremy has leaders and managers define strategies to implement digital and human transformations, utilizing, utilizing a unique co-created and award-winning ticking clock model. He has also co-created along with his business partner, Dr. Rochelle Hines, who's here on the call with us, a new framework of enterprise gig HR designed to better manage a more dispersed blended workforce, an emerging 2020s trend to set, set to become the biggest human capital shift in a generation. On the back of Jeremy's effort at industry and workplace level, he has been recognized by his industry peers and customers and named Global Game Changer of the Year 2009-2020 in the ACQ5 Global Awards. The bit that I love the most is coming now. Jeremy has pledged to support diversity, equity and inclusion in all its lenses and is a long-standing partner of Keynote Women Speakers Directory. Thank you, Jeremy. And today he will be sharing the findings of his new piece of research into the greatest human capital shift in a generation, the blended workforce revolution. Welcome, Jeremy. If you can just wave hi to Ricky and Pallavi and Kelly. We've got Kelly here as well now. Well, without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy to kickstart. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Anjali. Uh, a great welcome as always. Um, I'm, I'm gonna share my presentation now and take you through the first step of this journey into the blended workforce revolution. Uh, and that is a two-step journey as it happens. Uh, the first is around the research and findings, but the real juice behind this is the how-to model that helps organizations move forward from a human capital management HR perspective into this brave new world. And interestingly enough, this research was uh, launched in February, just one month before we were locked down, one month before the pandemic and before a huge accelerator hit our businesses. And the need for a, a different approach to not just business management, but human capital management is now racing towards us. So it feels like this was a very, um, a very apt piece of research that we did and very portentous in many ways. And that's what I'm gonna take you through. Um, the, just in terms of some definitions, which may help as we go through this, because there are so many definitions around this, we'll be talking about a few of these things. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll see that when I refer to contingent or independent workers, I could, I could, be referred to gig workers, the three Ps, the invisible workforce, alternative workforce, as Deloitte like to call it. There seem to be many terminologies, but really what we're talking about here is this rise of the independent workforce. Uh, those people that have chosen to um, be uh, gig workers, which we'll talk about the gig economy, contribute ad hoc or via project work or longer term contracts um to to organizations that are small medium and large um 
a subset of that are the digital nomads that are location free, uh, not just working on a beach, which seems to be the popular myth behind that, um, but who embrace digital means by to be to enable to work efficiently, effectively, and collaborate and communicate in real time. And then we move over to the right to our blended workforce, and we're really looking about the mix, and that mix is growing. It's permanent workers, it's permanent flexi workers, it's permanent remote workers, it's independent workers, our longer term contractors and other stakeholders. And we've had plenty of practice in the, in the past of managing our contingent workforces or services that we secure externally. But now actually what we're needing to do as our mix of workforce really starts to shift and to blend together, to bring a lot of this together, really looking at something that we need quite new, which is a brand new framework. That is in the context of those of you that attended our first webinar around in this series, around the Next Normal series, around where we are right now. When we entered the 2020s, we already had key forces hitting our businesses. We had digital and we have since COVID-19 had remote working hit us. Digital transformation still is something that many organizations are failing at, but have recently been forced into and are forced into an experimental phase. One of the reasons is the second force, and particularly the research that I've done over the last couple of days, has proved that many leaders around the world have not been ready in a state of taking this forward within the business. And that's from a digital transformation point of view, as well as a workforce uh, transformation point of view. And now we're adding to that ways of working point of view and exploring how dispersed work can be done just as efficiently as effectively. And it's raising more possibilities now. And many of these leaders are being forced forward to drive their capability. The third force is around culture shift. And as we move into the digital era, era, we are enabled through digital means, but we are unlocking and unleashing the human touch. I'd argue that in the digital era, that that is one of the most important competitive advantages that we have, not just from a, from a talent attraction and retention perspective, but also when we're talking about going to market with our customers, how we market and do things. So our culture has to adapt, and we're experiencing that now within COVID-19, in terms of how we're developing the right behaviors and values that suit a more dispersed remote working uh, culture within our organizations. The fourth is around what, what is, as we moved into the 2020s, we're having so much debate about broadening diversity lenses. And I don't have to remind everybody of the last sort of three, four, five weeks across the world of what's happening. This is really front and center. Although I did have a discussion with somebody yesterday um, and we were talking about the remote world and how working in a dispersed way is starting to break down some of these diversity lenses because we're all on a screen, we're all working together. Um, and it seems to be breaking down some of those traditional barriers uh, that we have. Let's hope that continues. The final one and probably one most appropriate for today as well is the gig era. Uh, the future workforce, the ways of working, the gig economy, uh, as we're talking about. And as I talk about the gig economy, this is what I mean. This is really the definition of, um, of what the gig economy uh, is all about. We all uh, know that, but you, you can have a read. But what's quite of interesting, if I just pick one country at the moment, which is the US, uh, there's almost already by the end of 2019, 60 million people employed as independent workers. That was predicted by 2027 to be about 130 million, uh, more than half of the working population within the US. Although with the pandemic, the accelerator behind that um, could half that time. So 2023, 2024. Interestingly enough, that 60 million were responsible for generating $1 trillion of, rev of revenue towards GDP within the US. That is the power of the gig economy. And the gig economy is fueled, like I said, it's enabled by the appropriate technologies that doesn't overwhelm the human touch, allows their expertise to come through and supports. Many of you may have used some of these. Uh, Just-in-time task management with Trello, uh, Fiverr for, for looking for everything from 
um, everything from uh, marketing to design to presentations to expertise. It, it's incredible. And that that is used by gig workers themselves as well as um, as a corporate enterprise. What that is driving um, is a is a kind of interesting workforce mix, really, and a change in terms of work sourcing. So we're moving from, if you like, work on demand, which is um, we were working in more synchronous ways. So we have a certain task coming up in, in, in a month. Uh, this is where it fits in our project timeline in terms of what we're doing. And therefore, this is the resource that we will need at that point. We can start looking internally and whatever expertise we need um, externally. We're now moving to more more asynchronous working, um, not reliant on time, dependencies, um, other projects ending, uh, where we can access expertise at any time so we can parallel our tasks. And that allows us to do more crowd, crowd work and crowdsourcing, um, completing work through online platforms, and much more doing, this, doing it this way, not just from a sourcing point of view, but collaboration, communication, and completion of the projects this is the new way of work and in fact it's the way that google uh, prefer to work um, not only are over half of their workforce made up of temporary workers independent workers known as tvcs um, but they they have multiple projects in place around uh, crowdsourcing this was the background to our research and when rochelle and i were looking into this we felt that while while traditional human capital management, HR, business management intuitively knew this, we, we outsource our work, we do this. What we realized very quickly is that this hasn't been formalized in many organizations. There aren't any structures in place that, um, that go beyond just management of the project and the people who are involved in that project to consider it as a, as a larger human capital management need. Uh, that's kind of almost tomorrow but the need is today that mix of the workforce is is growing hugely as i'll show you uh, as i'll show you in a minute so the blended workforce this mix of our permanence with um different subsets of independent workers will become the norm quicker than we think and we need to do something about it so our research to get behind that um, was wide and varied. I, I, I'm not going to go into this, just to say that it was a robust survey um, across over about 36 uh, countries, which mixed not just a survey, but also mixed interviews with both uh, independent workers and uh, corporate and uh, human capital leaders. Uh, and that's why we mixed actually the survey set to make sure that we had a lot of feedback by, from the independent workforce themselves, as well as the corporate space, uh, because there are some very interesting things that are happening and some more interesting things that are not happening, uh, which is which group, which for us then led to the need for a new framework. Um, so I'm going to just take you through some of the headlines, but what we also have for everybody um, online here or who accesses the recorded version of this webinar is the instant download of the more robust uh, white paper that goes into far more detail into the interviews that we've done as well as the research that we have so you can access that uh, ongoing. So without further ado, let me go into it um, for, the, uh, uh, for the research findings. So the first key finding that, that really hits us in the eye that 60% of all kind of business and HR leaders say that, yep, you know, this, the independent workforce is going to become a big part of our business. And in fact, by 2025, it will become as much as 40% of our over overall um, global workforce. Uh, that was pre-pandemic. So Rochelle and uh, I went back to uh, the survey set um, uh, just about a month ago. We did a couple of interviews. We went back to a lot of the people that we, that we talked to that answered the surveys. And we asked them again, uh, is, is anything changing around this? And interesting to us, what came out was the conclusion that actually this could now be as accelerated up to by the end of 2022, that by the end of that year, 40% of our workforce could be made up of independent workers. Now, if that is the case, we absolutely need a way to um, reimagine our human capital management and our resources management um, 
internally, but also with these external workers. So that really is kind of a mindset shift, which first needs to happen very quickly. Then we need to think about the new rules of the road, the structures, the processes to do that. Um, and that's uh, to Rochelle and I, that came across very, very early in the, um, in the research. And when we looked at possible frameworks that were out there to, to manage this shift, really not, not much existed apart from what we have right now. But Rochelle is going to talk about something brand new around that. Um, the, the interesting thing is though as well, because this is done in a rather project by project, rather more informal uh, way, then there has been little thought in terms of the formal attraction, recruitment, retention, value, uh, reward for the independent workers as part of our valued human capital mix. And that will need to change over the next few years, particularly uh, as this grows. And, and particularly, we see more people going into the independent workforce now, really just from the trends in the last three months. Um, you know, many organizations are already announcing downsize. Some uh, people have already experienced the power now of remote working and are making that call. And we already found that actually the biggest population moving uh, to um, independent work through this research in the last two years has been Generation X. That's my generation. Those people that said, you know what? I'm not sure I need this corporate space anymore. I don't really want to take over the leadership at this business at the same time as we were the so-called leaders in waiting. I think I can do this better on my own and share my experience. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting dynamics uh, happening out there. There is always two sides to the story, but here's some headlines. Um, what we found in the research that um, the independent workforce really wasn't being managed so it was it was certainly being told what to do and measured quite rigorously but not really managed and communicated to effectively and therefore um you know we had to therefore look at the mirror image of this and we have to acknowledge that many independent workers particularly the millennials who are very good at if you like the expertise that they're offering um what came out of the research is that they they haven't had the experience to build their knowledge skills, behaviors around some of those core skills that many of us that have been in the corporate world know. So stakeholder management, uh, communication skill sets, um, uh, and negotiation techniques, you know, or most of these so-called soft skills, which now I refer to as power skills, because then there's nothing soft about them, let me tell you. These are the skills which will make the difference in this in this world. Um, and one of those key areas that, that there appear to be a clash is, particularly with the digital nomads who were working independently, was crashing up against traditional either functional or human capital HR management who were working in largely traditional ways, still locked into 20th century legacy systems within their organizations and ways of working, not breaking out of those processes and not really embracing the new digital means, for example, like kind of crowdsourcing and crowd completion in terms of project management, sharing online, etc. So a number of things happening. Um, but <clears throat> I think because of this largely informal nature, project work, independent workforce not really being seen as really a part of our company and our, of our DNA, but a convenience or an expert in a particular area, particularly IT, for example, and independent workers who were happy, you know, many of them happy to have the job and move in there um, and not being skilled in having those discussions, particularly around contracts. Uh, we found that, you know, three quarters of independent workers uh, were on high risk payment contracts. And uh, we, as I said, we did many interviews here and I've just peppered a few uh, quotes from our interviews in this. This is one from a digital nomad and writer in Thailand um, that says putting people on precarious uh, contracts happens a lot in the gig economy. Um, um, and I'll read this out in full for you that that way they, the clients, can offload risks onto you, saving themselves money, taxes, health benefits, etc. It's very exploitative a way of employing people and it puts a lot of risks onto me. Now, we're not saying this happens all the time, but it happens enough to be very present and real for many independent workers. Um, according to the, 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 when we went back, therefore, to independent workers, we said, well, from your experience, what would work here? What are the things that would make the difference um, to a relationship for both sides? Um, and these were then here. It's being outcome focused. 
It's about being support orientated, um, adapting to different ways of working. And that goes both ways, obviously. Um, and um, simplifying things, making things clearer. Things get really complicated, particularly when different functions are in place. This was a major um, piece of feedback that came out of interviews and the survey. The level of complexity when um, I'm hired for project X here with this outcome, but by the time it finishes, it's something completely different. And so many more people uh, are involved and I'm the one with all the pressure, <laughs> they're saying. And, and obviously point five is really key. I think, you know, fair, fair and equitable approach in terms of how we're treated, contracts, respects, all of those things. You'll forgive me for going through this a little bit quick, but you can go through the, the white paper, as I, as I said. Um, and, you know, on that point, um, the, the, one of the big issues for independent workers is the, is the need uh, versus what they're getting. The need is for a little bit more security longer term contracts versus short term that's what they want to move towards uh, over the next five years remember that was february i'm guessing that that has accelerated as well to more longer term uh, contracts um and you know what they also want is they want to feel part of this they want to also be recognized for what they do now when they do outstanding work and this is this is really key um, six, you know, 40% of them only will get some kind of recognition. 60% don't even get recognized or, you know, dare I say it, rewarded for outstanding work. But what is, seems to be very quick is where some things don't go, don't go right. Many of the feedback that we got from the um, independent workers themselves, which we also have to take with a pinch of salt, of course, was that, you know, we're a very convenient blame for things that go wrong even if the process is internally or the, the collaboration and stakeholders aren't doing their work internally in the organizations. Um, the, the, the other thing that's happening that we, that we saw that came out in our, uh, that I now will look very smugly at this piece of, uh, of, of research, when we, when we uh, launched it in February, we were looking at workplace workspace as well and enabling tools in terms of what are the most conducive to high quality work when you're an independent worker, collaborative work when you're working with corporates. So um, the prediction from our research was that in the next five years, uh, most will be working from home or remote locations and co-working spaces. Well, we got the first one right, <laughs> no, particularly the last three months, we'll see how that evolves. Um, but certainly other remote locations will come up, who knows what will happen post pandemic. Um, but um, it is absolutely for sure that remote working is here to stay and is going to be a bigger part of what we do post pandemic. Um, but being collaborative and particularly when we launched this collaborative workspaces was the most productive environment to work. So and that is for both permanent and independent workers. So being collaborative, making sure we've got these spaces, whether it's online or whether it's offline, is really absolutely key. And then making sure that that is all wrapped around an ecosystem which actually talks together. Systems that talk together, that don't kind of compete against each other. Um, tools that enable how we co-work and collaborate and more. The, the, the other thing that, that, we, that we felt that came through very, very strongly um, in, this, in this research was around diversity, inclusion and bias. And we talked a little bit about that uh, uh, before when I, when I started. Um, existing issues are going to be challenged further. And that, you know, that, that diversity or inclusion issue now might now include permanent versus independent workers rather than, you know, the usual diversity lenses that we're talking about, the, the gender, race, culture, you know, all of these. The diversity lenses are much broader in this world. And a couple of quotes that, that uh, came out from here, I think were, were really key. Um, from one business owner who, who uses independent workers, um, the idea that we shouldn't treat someone who's working remotely in a similar way to someone who is on a permanent contract is a dangerous thing and ultimately leads to bad behavior and lack of success. We've seen some of that already. We abuse remote workers at our peril. If we're saying that, the, that your workforce potentially is made up 40% of independent workers within two years, then of course, you know, we have to be able to attract uh, our independent workers as if we were attracting talent for our permanent resource. So a rethinking around recruitment practices as well, 
attraction, retention, value, reward, recognition, uh, celebration, all of those things as part of the workforce. This is a very interesting quote from an independent project worker in, in Jamaica <clears throat> who, who we interviewed, uh, millennial um, on around bias and tolerance. And as you read through this, I'll just explain, I'll just pull out one of the key points here, is that she was hired um, to help this organization move away from a more patriarchal, very traditional old school approach to their leadership management and running of the business to build a stronger diversity of culture. But what she came up across were the same biases um, and, um, and diversity issues that were the root cause of this issue that she was coming herself, not just through her race and color, but through her age as a, free, a young freelancer. And it just had a huge impact. And it was just so interesting that the whole project was about this as well. And, and they, they you know, couldn't help themselves, it seems, within this organization. Um, and so, you know, that is really a brief uh, whirlwind tour of our um, of our um, of our research. And as I mentioned, um, by the end of that, we felt that we needed to go a step further and talk about a how to. Um, nothing seemed to exist that formalized practices around a much more diverse workforce mix between permanent, independent workers, independent long term and short term contractors, etc particularly if it's going to become almost half of our workforce within the next couple of years. So what we felt was a, a brand new manifesto for change, which we called Gig HR. And I'm now happy to hand over to Dr. Rochelle Haynes, um, who really is the, you know, the, the co-architect of, uh, of this research and the real driver behind, you know, how do we get to action here and provide a framework so organizations can fast track and accelerate this journey. So. Uh, Rochelle, over to you. Thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, I'm just going to share my screen really quickly so I can get into the slides as well. So just give me one second. And I'll pull them up on my end. So, okay. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. Let's go here. Share there. Present. So I'll start from where Jeremy left off. Um, so it was really good as well that Jeremy highlighted a lot of the um, the follow-up research, especially with the impact of COVID. And one of the things that we found a lot of companies saying to us, um, we found a lot of companies in the Caribbean, a lot of companies within the UK and the US saying that since they've had the experience of remote working, and since in some cases they've had to lay off staff and some persons have been furloughed, that that is now going to be the new normal. Some companies have said they've, they've cancel the lease on their office building. You're no longer going to go back to work and into the office. But now they have to figure out ways of managing these new remote workforce or also that very independent workforce because of, in some cases where they've had to cut staff, they've had to find other means of getting the project done. So instead of having someone full time, they're now going for independent contractors to do that same work, but on a project basis. So the, the need for the framework was very important at the time when we produced the study and even before then, but then in light of COVID and in light of the, the current global pandemic and everything that's happened around that, um, it's even further advanced the need for it or accelerated the need for it. And what we sought to do in our framework, what we created was what we call Gig HR. And we depicted this as a house because that house provides, a house is seen as a safe space for an individual. It's seen as a place where you can go for protection and for love and comfort and so forth. So we thought that this was a good way to, let's say, portray the idea of gig HR as a gay house where everyone um, who is in the workforce can, can feel welcome and can feel, uh, can have the ultimate work experience, can feel supported and that it's a safe space that they can be developed. So in our framework, what we have here is four rooms. I'm going to go into each room individually, but this is just to give you an overall view of the framework. If you look on the left here, you see gig shade. Now, how we describe that, or what these bullet points you see here are, 
are the effects or consequences of not managing the blended workforce um, in an, eff an effective way or a way that's suitable for all workers. And one of the major drivers of this when I first, um, when we first pursued the research was within organizations, within organizations we spoke to, and also as an academic, when I'm teaching within the classroom, one of the things that I constantly saw and organizations were constantly portraying were HR systems and HR models and processes that were designed for the full-time employee. Whereas the workforce has changed so drastically since a lot of the models, those models were produced and those HR practices were, let's say, implemented, but the, those practices have not kept pace with the changes within the workforce. So when we conducted that research, and as Jeremy highlighted, when we saw a lot of those facts emerging with regards to the, let's say, the, the conflict and the differences between the work expectations of those who work independently, remotely, and otherwise, to the organizations, the expectation of the organizations that hired them, then we sat down and we started brainstorming about okay, what is it that we can do to ensure that everyone has the best experience of work possible? And how can we help human capital leaders in this area? So this is where we came up with the Gig House, and I'm going to go into it a bit further. I'm, very, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to jump right into it. So we started in the Gig House with the, the framework, and one of the things we were stressing here was to create a culture within that organization to begin with. So go back to the organization vision and values and how are those things articulated and communicated and think about whether or not those things are really aimed at everyone within your workforce as opposed to those that are seen on a daily basis. With the change to remote working, we've also seen that um, a lot of companies, this has become quite confronting for a lot of companies who sought to transfer their organizational culture, office culture, into the digital world. And a lot of companies found that that didn't work out very well for them. If in some cases, employees, even full-time employees, became a lot more stressed. So it's very, it very much caused us for a excuse me, a review of the current organizational culture. So as we build our foundation, then we created these four rooms. And now if I'm going to go into these four rooms in a um, clockwise manner. So I'll start at the bottom first. And in our first room, we have the gig rules. So in the previous slide, you would have seen gig rules, gig tools, gig skills, and gig thrills. So with regards to gig rules, what we were speaking about here is your future organizational strategy and how that is put together. Have you actually put protocols in places that, protocols in place, sorry, that incorporate your digital workforce, that incorporate those who work in, independently, and also the way in which they work? How have you, um, what thinking have you given towards the creation of a work experience and also workspace, what we refer to here as a work habitat that is suitable not just for your full-time employee, even if that full-time employee is working remotely, but also for the person that's working on an independent or part-time basis or so forth or through a platform. So it's really going through that step-by-step -step process of how you get from strategy to work execution with regards to how that fits every, every person within your blended workforce as opposed to catering for just a few. So after the tool, the rules, we stressed the need, sorry, other way, we stressed the need to also have an infrastructure in place that supports the way in which every individual works. So this, in this way, we're definitely pressing home the need to accommodate persons that work remotely, independently, and through digital means. So thinking about your digital infrastructure, and um, Jeremy spoke earlier about platforms like Trello, and he spoke earlier about, <coughs> excuse me, other um, crowdsourcing or work on crowd, crowd platforms where people work through our project management systems. So this section here, that's, it speaks about having that architecture within the organization so how does that connect to the other objectives and strategic um, needs and the need for compliance as well? I know a lot of companies are very concerned about data security, about the way information is shared when you're working with people remotely. So what has your company put in place to ensure that you're truly protected? What are the protocols that you have in place? And how do you involve those persons that you work with in ensuring that you meet all of the demands and objectives and that those things aren't actually conflicting with each other. 
And then also we spoke about the ownership and measurements in terms, and that's why we have this circle um, going, like, going like a cycle, because it's important that we're constantly reviewing and taking ownership of this process to ensure that you can constantly improve it as the workforce changes as well. So what are the new digital needs? What's the new need for transformation within your company as um, the workforce continues to become more diverse and more dynamic? So then we went into, coming down, we spoke about skills and this was really speaking about preparing also your workforce to work in this or to be as highly effective um, or extremely developed in this new world of work. And here the priority is not just on digital workers, sorry, the priority is not just on companies to develop workers, but the responsibility is shared between workers and those um, that are hiring them. So it's the responsibility of both, let's say, digital nomads or independent contractors, as well as the companies who hire them to ensure that their workforce have the skills that they require. And in the new world of work, we just highlighted a lot of the key skills that are important to, let's say, remain relevant and employable and a strategic um, contributor within the company or that partnership that you're working with. So we highlighted here a few digital skills in terms of digital literacy, data and information literacy. But then we also mentioned the softer skills that Jeremy mentioned earlier. And then we put those together and we refer to them as digital skills, where and individuals are capable of adapting as the workplace changes. As we speak to companies, the most important skill they say that they value from their employees is adaptability and flexibility, especially also resilience in the, in the new world of work, especially where the environment is changes so rapidly. So making sure that um, companies have a platform where they're considering the relevant skills and the relevant ways of working in terms of how are you introducing your learning and development? Are you dependent on, let's say, the same old online um, short courses or um, let's say mandatory training? Or are you constantly reviewing your training cycle and offering your training in different ways that's accessible to everyone? So a lot of the digital nomads that we spoke to, they say one of the things that they really value when working for companies are those companies, let's say, that offer a discount to certain learning platforms where they can go away and do the learning themselves. So for example, if a company hires a digital nomad and they offer, let's say, 50% discount to, at, um, to learn courses on Udemy or, or lynda.com through the company's account. So digital nomads said those are one of the things that they, they really prioritize uh, when choosing who to work with. And one of the things that makes this particularly important is catering, um, not just for the full-time but part-time workers, is because as this skill set grows, sorry, as this um, group of workers grow, then the competition for them as well, um, organizations have more access to the higher demands and higher skilled employees from across the globe and competition for those workers grow. So we, we spoke to a lot of digital nomads that also said, that they choose who they want to work with based on the organizational culture, based on whether they're recognized, based on whether they're developed or so forth. So whereas you would have seen in the past a lot of digital nomads or let's say independent contractors being concerned about what opportunities come their way, they might have said, okay, I'll just take work from where I get it. You're now finding digital nomads and independent contractors being a lot more choosy um, in terms of who they work with. So then our final room, coming down here, um, is gig thrills. And this is really just stressing the need to reward every person within the digital um, space, within that blended workforce, and recognize them for the effort that they contribute to the company's overall strategic objectives. As Jeremy highlighted, most of digital nomads are most of independent contractors. They're not recognized for the quality of work that they do. And often, if, that, if the work goes the wrong way, they're the first ones to take the blame. And whereas you have your full-time employees, if there's something that goes wrong, if you have a full-time employee that's been working for 20 years, and then all of a sudden, in a few months, their performance drops and they're not performing well, 
you might go to that full-time employee and you'll say, okay, well, we noticed this change in your work behavior uh, and your results. What's been going on here and how can we help? How can we support you? And you might put a plan in place for that person. Um, what typically happens with the gig worker, they don't have that luxury. If something goes wrong in their space and often something goes wrong on the company company's end, that person's contract might be terminated, they're not referred, they're not worked with again, where often the reason for their poor performance is not considered in the same way that you would consider the, the full-time employee. So here really speaks of the need to create a system to truly connect, collaborate and connect and cultivate, cultivate a culture of, of celebration that includes all types of workers. So really building a, a work habitat and an ecosystem that considers the need um, and the expectations of all types of workers and gives each of them that equal platform to perform of their ver very best to the firm. Because the way in which firms accommodate all types of workers will very much determine the output that those workers are able to contribute to that firm. And then we had as our roof, um, one of the things that's been very evident with COVID is the need to really be intuitive and sensitive as a leader. And this is for everyone in your workforce, taking that time to reach out and put things in place to um, ensure the well-being of your staff. Again, staff speaking about that very wide group of workers. So this is something that we were saying or we were stressing should be, let's say, the glue or the, the protecting element over these other areas when you're considering your strategy to make sure you have that sort of safety net for all persons that you're working with. So that's where we, where I mentioned the gig shade before, where you're able to effectively achieve these four, the elements in these four rooms, then you can achieve the benefits of the gig shine, that's what we call it. In terms of having a workforce and an independent workforce within that workforce, with a growth mindset, who feel very um, a part of the company and are very responsive. But in saying that, also recognizing that not all independent or digital workers want to feel like a part of the company. They're just happy enough to have the ability to work effectively and treated fairly with the company um, and by the company. So uh, that's, that's a massive consideration. So it's very important um, if you want to achieve these various elements under the Gig Shine platform that you're able to execute in certain areas and really have a culture of inclusion, not from the traditional lenses of diversity, but considering the way in which people want to work and those new and changing work expectations. So I'm going to stop there now because I'm very conscious of the time, um, but we speak on these topics on various platforms and on our websites, we also have a range of, um, let's say, consulting and coaching opportunities or, um, that's the master classes and so forth that you can find out more about how to include and how to implement this platform. So I'm gonna shift from here and I'm gonna hand over to Annie because I'm very aware that we don't have much time left, but thank you. No problem, sure, thank you very much. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share uh, my screen. Just let me know when you can see this. Uh, it's gonna be popping up. Alrighty, so I hope you can all see my screen right now. Okay, so I take it as a yes. Yes. Alrighty, perfect, not a problem. Well, thank you very much, uh, you know, Jeremy and uh, Rochelle. Um, I, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, really is to share back with you on HR implications uh, on the tech uh, innovation and the gig economy on the blend, blended workforce. You know, as uh, many of the business swiftly pivot their operations to adapt to the new uh, demands during the pandemic, the notion um, of the workplace rapidly alters uh, as remote uh, working gains uh, the traction itself. So it took us a long, um, you know, to embrace digitization and to understand the future of work. Uh, but it took simply just 100 days uh, during the lockdown, you know, at the pandemic period to visualize from crisis mode to the extended work from home. So many companies have already increased their investment in technology, uh, digitization, speed up in enablement to allow employee positive uh, work from home experience. You know, um, given that I am from the cloud technology company itself, um, I have seen tremendous growth uh, in my organization. We are adapting very fast 
uh, in terms of catching up uh, with uh, the new normal. So this has created opportunities to remote and flexible workforce and to optimize work from home as a new norm. You know, um, I see that human uh, being as someone who can adjust and we are forced to adapt and adjust, uh, it's a choice. And the new norm of the future of work is being accelerated. Um, so this is, um, you know, a momentous change uh, which gave a huge, um, you know, rise in terms of organization, talent, HR challenges at a time where business leaders are already wrestling with unprecedented risks of pandemic, disruption and political and societal um, upheaval. You know, the skills that needs are shifting. Uh, earlier on, as uh, Rochelle and Jeremy has mentioned. Now, industries across the board uh, adopt new technologies and gradually automate their HR operations, reducing manual work and transactional uh, activities. So HR can clearly play a strategic role in digitization and technology enablement, develop skilled employees, and reimagine our workforce from attraction to retention on the cups of a pandemic. Now, through the use of technology, uh, there are both pros and cons to the employees. Um, what it means to larger companies to drastically reduce their internal and external costs, uh, reshape their facilities and office space, and trimming now down really the non-core projects or the non-core functions and roles. You know, earlier on, we have heard that um, organizations can be more productive um, and can expand their operations to example, like the hybrid uh, workforce, the TAMs, the contractors, the three Ps, uh, the independent or contingent workers, however you may term it uh, differently. But this whole ecosystem, it means to say that the flexible workforce, we may not necessarily have to have um, what we call uh, FTE or full-time uh, headcount, but more in terms of how do we blend uh, this sort of a workforce together. And this also means that with this remote working, talent pool is not location specific uh, anymore. It means to say that we can talent pool available anywhere with the right skills, with the right time, and you know, with the right competencies. So from organization perspective, it gives rise to significant amounts of agile human capital and flexible workforce. It provides agility to flex, and scale up and down, you know, depending on the human capital fluidity, right, according to the demands and the supply to meet the current business needs and the future workforce planning. Now, to do so successfully, um, it requires new model, new thinking, require us to reimagine HR and bring our leadership along this journey, all right, and pivot against human-centric, you know, leadership demonstrating empowerment, empathy, and engaging trust to amplify inclusive culture, which will play a big part from attraction to retention to bring this blended workforce, a flexible workforce into the ecosystem. Now, um, you know, I I'm very privileged to work uh, in a cloud technology company because we are really living through uh, this fundamental transformation in the way we work, powering a better way to work using enabled technologies to allow uh, employees to be more productive. So digitization, automation, thinking machines, AI, are really the changing skills that organizations are looking for in their people. And to do this, we must really harness the uncertainty, really harness the technologies to enable employees to be productive in one experience. When I talk about one experience, um, we would I'll share this a little bit more later. To do this, we must really make sure that, um, you know, we understand the future of work, um, it's about performance being delivered on the organization goals, all right? But more importantly, employees' behaviors, the societal impact. Work is often uh, a fluid concept uh, and a regimented nine to five, Monday to Friday, um, you know, a working week is rare. You know, so of course, uh, you know, sometimes the borders between home and work sometimes uh, can be blurred, right? But I think it's important, like, we understand that work now can be done anywhere, anytime, all right? And the talent pool, it's available globally, all right? And hopefully, you know, with this, um, you know, um, on one device, you know, whether it's on your laptop, on your computer, on your phone, um, it is important that we build empowerment and trust, building the flexible work environment, it is key because physical location does not matter uh, the most. The most important is the culture of trust, following and you know, how do we blend in this uh, hybrid workforce 
encourage diversity of thoughts, ideas, uh, and uh, uh, innovation. Now, interestingly, um, as we uh, uh, talk about this itself, you would see that um, the next new normal, right? Um, we uh, in Citrix, we have actually done uh, a, a recent polling, you know, and really in the recent polling itself, 74% of the companies uh, plan to permanently shift to a more remote working. So as we work um, along this itself, um, you know, it supports work-life balance, but I would rather say also work-life integration or balanced uh, work-life or work-life meaning, whatever you term it. But it's important for us to integrate the multi-generation workforce, the gig economy, the contingent workforce, to have flexibility, right? To be able to balance their roles as caregivers, uh, mothers, home dads. It opens us opportunity for the new gig economy and to a broader talent pool um, you know, globally. So when we focus on this topic, the revolution on the blended workforce, you know, I really urge our leaders to focus at people, uh, not just jobs. Um, I think this is really an important uh, essence of it. You know, um, and organizations sometimes cannot protect their jobs, but what they can really do um, is to be able to support the people, you know, whose jobs could be made redundant by technology. So we all have a responsibility to our people and, and our employees. So protecting people, not the job, because work is really uh, an uh, outcome, right? And work is really something that we have to be able to nurture the people. Um, nurture the agility, the adaptability, um, and about reskilling our people, um, bringing the trusted culture to this blended workforce where people are empowered uh, to work and to bring their true and the best productive self uh, uh, to work. Uh, so over here, I really want to emphasize the way we hire, um, the way we um, going to be, um, you know, interviewing the candidates for recruitment is going to transform dramatically. You know, so we must evolve, we must revolutionize. Um, so for me, I really felt that it is important for us to think about the shift from human capital management to really about the human experience, you know, that we have uh, engaging uh, with the employees. Because only truly itself, we can make transformation uh, to uh, include the blended workforce, um, our multi-generation and diversity of thoughts, all right? Um, here I wanted to share, um, you know, how do we bring this multi-generation workforce, gig economy, the digital nomads. HR really needs to work, um, you know, uh, in partnership uh, with uh, the leaders to build a very strong um, and clear um, uh, narrative. You know, I think our workplace uh, will be um, shaped uh, over the coming uh, decade. Um, and a third of our, um, you know, workers are going to be anxious about their future and their job due to AI digitization. So it will only speed up during this pandemic, right? So while anxiety may kill confidence and willingness for hiring managers to think out of the box to innovate, so we as HR must facilitate this conversation to educate our HR, our hiring managers, to adopt this flexible work arrangement, embrace contingent workers, allow the workforce to be more agile, all right. I think this is really um, being more uh, the future of work. So I would encourage you know us uh, as leaders to start a mature conversation and change and reimagine uh, really the new revolution of uh, workforce. All right. Um, and so with that itself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over uh, back to Anjali. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, Annie. Um, I encourage uh, the audience to start thinking of the questions that they want to ask. Uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can throw the question in the chat box. But up until then, I will start with asking a few questions. Um, so um, my question is to all three uh, speakers. Um, anyone can answer it. Um, I think you know, it's very clear from the research, uh, from Jeremy's point of view, it was very clear for me as to this is happening. And uh, when Rochelle spoke, it was very clear, this is what you must do. And when Annie spoke, it's, um, it was very clear as to how HR is responding to it. But I think one of the key things that we all know about in many major change in an organizational or corporate setting is this, or even outside of it, you know, a theoretically a change can look in a certain way, but actual adoption of it in an organizational setting 
can mean something completely different. So, you know, when you look at the organizations who are kind of moving into this blended workforce already are sort of the trailblazers like Google and Salesforce and all. Um, I just wanted to know if any one of you kind of uh, know about how long roughly it has taken them or in your view, how long would it, organ would it take organizations to really start getting into perform mode? Um, any perform mode, uh, to, would it take for the organization to get into perform mode? Because right now, you know, we, we know that theoretically what we need to do, but I wonder what's your view on actually seeing real performance with all, armed with all this knowledge on the ground? So anyone can answer that question, not for anyone specific. I can share, you know, from, uh, you know, our previous experience. What we do is that to, it is uh, something that we are already working. Uh, in my previous experience, whether with GSK or with Sanofi, we have always been able to embrace the flexible, you know, the, the blended workforce. Now, usually it begins with the first A, that is, they need to be aware. You know, many a times itself, you know, leaders sometimes does not understand the rationale, the business needs, and what is the business rationale? What is it in for them? Why do they have to change? You know, we are very comfortable with the current workforce. Why do we need to blend in all of um, the flexible workforce? And some of these remote workers may not be in the office. How do I interact with them? What is the KPI? What is the productivity? So I would define that maybe um, in terms of three stages. Um, so, so, you know, obviously the, the, the first stage is for them to be really uh, be aware um, that we are going to have this change. We're going to introduce uh, the flexible workforce, right? So uh, that is the first stage. And obviously within the first stage itself, we have to build in what we call transitional, all right? Transitional because sometimes we may have to introduce maybe not a full-time, maybe, um, you know, a, a sort of a remote worker on the 12 months or a 14 months, uh, 18 months down the road. So this transitional itself, this replacing, this transition requires an education. So we need to build in a change management program for them. All right. Finally, the third stage is about transformation. All right. So this radical shift itself requires them to bring them along this journey because when their desire is high, they understood the awareness, we must give them the knowledge, the education. But at the same time, HR needs to perform and show them the ability to execute and integrate this flexible workforce. And finally, of course, with this uh, transformation, we continuously have to reinforce uh, the messages about the benefits, what is the long-term sustainability in order to really see the fruition of the real outcome and impact to the business. Yeah, so thank you for that, Annie. There are some questions specifically uh, for Jeremy. I will ask them in a minute. Jeremy, I'll give you a few seconds to get ready. But Annie, I sort of wanted to dig deeper in one of the points that you made. You said that it is really important for us to educate the leadership team because they fail to see what's in it for them. So if I may very foolishly ask you, what's in it for them? Uh, why, why, why is blended workforce the right way to move for, for, for organizations? So how, how, do, how do you answer that? Yeah, I think there is no uh, one right size today, but I would say, uh, you know, a pivot on two scale. Number one is flexibility. All right. The flexibility whereby they can call out for the talent pool anytime, anywhere, and you have a very large talent pool worldwide. You know, you don't have to depend on location anymore. Number two, it's pivot on scalability. Right. The scalability meaning to say that if today I have a project itself and this project requires, uh, you know, cyber, cyber space skills, cyber security, cloud engineers, I need them to complete within a 12 month period. But after 12 months, I may not be able to continue with this project, but, you know, they are going to they are going to do this 12 months project successfully. So this allow us in terms of scalability. So the in, what is it in for them is that we are able to deliver outcome on the dot with the best demands and supply matching. At the same time, optimization of the business, um, you know, I would say budget. Yeah. So Annie, what, what do you think? How, you know, how roughly, what do you think is the, is the life of this change management process for, for an organization? So, you know, if, if as a consultant, you know, Jeremy or Rochelle get asked, how long do you think we need to have your consult going so that we can start seeing the performance from this blended workforce? 
what, what, what would you say to something like that? Yeah, I think it depends on the maturity curve of the organization, right? So again, it also depends on the size of the organization, whether it's an SME, a state-owned enterprise, or you know, a smaller size company or a medium-sized MNC. But in essence itself, it is a maturity of the organization. I would say it would take anything between about six months to about 12 months or 14 months period. Right, wonderful. Many thanks for that, Annie. Um, I have a question specifically for Jeremy. Jeremy, the question is, I am assuming this question is from Ricky, I'm not sure. Um, the question is, based on your survey, are there any specific regions that are ahead in the market in adopting or being more open towards the blended workforce model? Um, yes, well, there's, there's, a, there's a few ways to answer this. Uh, the first, I would say, is kind of straight, uh, Asia uh, rising. Uh, this, this, as well as digital transformation um, research that I did the year before this, really proved that a lot of the adoption of new ways of working, um, enabling business with digital, exploring different, different ways of doing, is much more common and much in done in a much more agile way in the asia pacific they're kind of used to used to doing this um the the not so obvious piece within that so that's kind of a broad a broad regional um brush however within that the other the other dynamic which is really obvious is that it's emerging economies so not necessarily just the emerged ones that that are embracing these but emerging economies are now able to leapfrog sort of traditional journeys, not just from a digital tra tra uh, transformation point of view, but how they work and embracing new ways of working and embracing is exactly as Annie said, a global talent pool versus a just a, a, a talent pool within 30 kilometers of their, of their corporate HQ. So at, at economy level, um, and market level, um, it's it's helping emerging economies sort of flatten the playing field and and move forward and start to accelerate. And I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking parts of South America. I'm thinking Africa, particularly places like Nigeria and Ghana. And uh, Rochelle, you can tell me if I'm wrong on that one. Uh, but I think we we did quite a lot of interviews in those areas uh, that proved it. Um, and 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 on the other, on the flip side of it, which is the independent workers themselves, it's again flattening the playing field. Um, our, our digital nomad that I refer to in Jamaica can compete very well with a digital nomad who's established in New York, in Singapore, in uh, the Middle East, wherever it is. So it's actually giving us also from a sourcing and from a choice perspective, it's giving us an opportunity on that side too, to start to um, you know, come out and embrace. So we'll start to see much more independent workforces and expertises growing up from a emerging, uh, not just emerging economies, but but regions of the world that we don't often talk about in research enough of uh, places like Africa, you know, the huge continent in Africa, which is really, you know, where, where the next big things I think are going to happen. Yeah, that's, you know, I'm really glad you said the last point from where research doesn't emerge because you made a mention of Asia and then you made a mention of emerging sort of, you know, uh, economies and men made a mention of places that often didn't get didn't get talked about and then when we go back to the research we see we say in america currently there's third 30 percent of the people are already blended workforce so it's strange that all all the research you know it's kind of a peeve for me you know every time i look for research every research starts with uh, in America, uh, even though, you know, the trends are much faster and, and trends are showing better in, in, in other parts of the world. Um, there's another question here and um, uh, any one of you can answer this question. The question is specifically from Ricky. Transformation towards the blended model is quite a significant undertaking, especially when we see the gig house that Rochelle shared. Um, which area do you think companies should start with in their transformation journey? So maybe Rochelle, you can take that question. Um, so the question is, which area do you think the company should start within their transformation journey? So where do we start? I think one of the main areas to start, main places to start is looking at where you procure your workers and who is in charge of that process. Um, a lot of companies that we spoke to 
Um, in one company, they said it was HR's responsibility. In another company, they said HR has nothing to do with it. We outsourced this to an agency. Another company said, oh, that's for logistics. Another company said that's for procurement. So it's really getting clear and getting a clear understanding of where the responsibility lies um, for um, outsourcing or let's say outsourcing work to a particular group of workers. And he mentioned that this is quite done already in, in let's say Asian countries and some companies we've seen with Google and um, and he mentioned Sanofi are quite aware of this in terms of taking that sort of responsibility or working quite often or significantly with digital nomads or independent contractors but a lot for a lot of other companies it's seen as let's say that that five percent of workers that the agency deals with so I think it's really to to get that sort of clear understanding an awareness of how the workers contribute to the overall organizational effort and understand then and from there you can have a review of your strategy and your protocols to see whether or not they are suitable for that group of workers because they might i'm sure a lot of companies have found now that that workforce would have been let's say two percent or five percent a year ago and now that workforce is looking to be in their company up to 30 percent or 40 percent and, and that's not just remote work and that's independent working as well. So it's really getting an idea of where the ownership and responsibility lies um, for that transformative process, but also for that inclusive process. Yeah. So Rochelle, in companies like, do we have knowledge of where in companies like Google uh, the responsibility is? How, how are they managing it? Like who, who's accountable and who's taking the ownership? It's very interesting to use Google because they've actually gotten in trouble for this area, in this area. <laughs> Let's talk about it then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They've, had, um, they've had a very high profile case I, where... Sorry, 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 one minute, Rochelle. I think Pallavi wants to ask no, no, you something. I said, no? I said I'm shaking my head on that because I, I was aware of this. And some of yeah. my questions are related to that. So, so, yeah. so yeah, so Pallavi, do you want to ask Rochelle? So maybe we can yeah, get a combined yeah. answer. It's, it's not really a, uh, I mean, I, I kind of understand where she's coming from, right? It's, it's not so much uh, the tech companies. And this is really from my perspective of how we've started looking at uh, within IBM around gig workers, right? So firstly, there's no doubt that it's a talent pool that no organization going forward can afford to ignore. So yes, there is a need to bring them in. Uh, but then let's also be realistic about a few things, right? So number one, uh, not every remote worker needs to be a gig economy worker. So while COVID has given you the platform to be more welcoming for remote work, uh, th that's really more open for your own employees to start working from home. And so the big push right now on account of the pandemic is that your own employees can continue to work from home. So that doesn't necessarily open doors for gig economy. Now, gig economy itself, uh, and that, that was a question that I wanted to ask Rochelle is, if, is there any survey that you have done with employers in terms of the barriers? And the barriers that we are finding more and more as we start to discuss this, right? I believe the trends will be, and, and maybe Annie can and talk from a Singapore perspective, I believe one of the trends will be that uh, gig economy within a country is going to be more welcoming gig economy workers cross border will take a long a much longer time i won't say a very very long time but a much longer time simply because the, one of the reasons why companies and clients that the companies support and i talk about my own company and our clients you're supporting bankers you're banking you're supporting insurance you're supporting a whole lot of coding and security organizations who do not want intellectual property rights crossing borders. There is GDPR that is sitting in Europe that we are all aware of. So we are not going to necessarily see gig economy workers uh, at the higher expertise level be accessed cross borders so quickly. Within the country, if it's within Singapore, there is a, a, you know, a whole set of expertise that's available within the country and we want to bring them as a gig economy uh, within India, within US, Absolutely, but today look at the regulatory environment, the immigration environment, the security and other environment that's going on. If somebody is a worker in China today and look at the trade war going on between US and China, if there is some product or offering or service created by a Chinese worker for an American company, it's not necessarily that easy to you know, decide who's the owner of that because gig economy workers are not necessarily governed within the same parameters 
as your normal employees. That's mm -hmm. the protection that the company has. More and more as we start to get into artificial intelligence, one of the biggest things that we are starting to debate and all the big five companies, Google, Amazon, Apple, uh, you know, Microsoft, they've all formed this ethics and privacy board, which is actually looking at artificial intelligence coding, uh, coding uh, parameters, right? The, today, the ownership and accountability of the right kind of non-biased, privacy-protected coding lies with the companies. So, you know, if there is something that goes wrong, you hold the company accountable for that. Uh, but when you transfer that kind of work to a, a gig economy worker that doesn't have, that's kind of an individual dealing with an organization, how do you transfer accountability? So regulatory and legal laws and protections laws for employees need to actually come in place be before you can transfer that kind of work. So there are many, many nuances to the fact that how gig economy will shape up, I believe for non-complicated, non proprietal uh, you know, that kind of work, you might find a, a quicker audience. Um, and that's the reason when you go to campuses, so I go to NTU or SMU and what will I tell them as, a, as an employer? Why should you become a gig economy worker in IBM versus a regular employer in IBM, employee in IBM? I would, as of today, unless I, I can offer them the laws, I would not be able to create a really right, right value proposition for a gig economy worker. So I believe there is, there is appetite and there is definitely the right need to look at your four quadrants in terms of tools and resources. But I believe your, the box on rules, that needs to be twice as big because there's many, many angles that still haven't been addressed and will continue to complicate the discussion. That is just some perspective. I'm sorry, I spoke a little longer, but I just wanted to check if you've done any surveys with employers. Yeah, so thank you for that. And you hit a, you hit a lot of nails on the head there. So that's an area that we've definitely looked into and considered, especially not just from the rules box, but also in the tools box where we speak about data security and how do you ensure data security across borders and so forth. So when we speak about the blended workforce and the gig economy, I think often um, persons assume that we're talking always cross-border, whereas a, a gig worker can be a person that's working from a coffee shop today and from tomorrow they're working from home. So organizations is, is such a diverse and dynamic category that organizations are not just restricted um, to trying to pull talent from um, China or India or so forth, but we're talking about um, even from your local city, but just that person who's an independent contractor and a consultant working from home. So you can't, some companies can avoid, let's say the, the intricacies or complexities in that way by determining which um, regions they choose to procure workers or which areas. Um, you're very much right, GDPR is a consideration and within the UK in particular, IR35 is another big consideration and uh, one that they're still kind of trying to work out. They, they've consistently, delay the introduction of it because they're not exactly how sure it, um, how, how it would work, especially um, they don't want to limit companies' access to talent, but at the same time, they want to ensure that companies remain protected and have um, adequate, they're, they're adequately, let's say, was sourcing their workers from, let's say, ethical places and so forth. So there's definitely a lot of consideration for there. When we presented the framework, and this is why we offer it also as um, we offer this, it's, it's, it's very hard to go into in 10 minutes. I was trying to cover it all in 10 minutes, but those five um, circles that we cover with regards to blended protocols and tools and rules and tools and so forth. When we work with companies and we do more interactive workshops, we then break down those rules a bit further in terms of, okay, what are some of those rules? How might that work within the company and the, let's say the, the regions that that company has to interact with? What are some of the barriers to that as you've identified with regards to the regulatory barriers? In some cases, it's cross-cultural barriers. So there are, there are a lot of different dynamics within that context. I just wrote down some of the things you said so I can, I can come back to them. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you said quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a um, discussion, but you know, these are some of the yeah. things that we struggle with. Uh, even we, we want to do it, but you know, yeah. we always get stammied by, by so many of these that we, we kind of then just take a bit of, okay, let yeah. me go. I think it's a step-by-step -step process. I know in terms of surveys, Deloitte has done a lot of surveys with regards to the challenges of the blend economy. There's a, um, 
a group here called Good Work, Fair Work, sorry, Fair Work. And they've done a recent survey in terms of the impact of COVID on the gig economy and some of the challenges that organizations have to, for providing for those employees. So there's data out there. Our data set was um, from, it was more corporate. And then we went and actually we went to the gig spaces. We went to Thailand, went to Bali, and we spoke to persons to understand their perspective behind the screen as well. So there is, there's no perfect solution, but in terms of the framework that we've created, is for organizations to, to sit down and consider that. So if it is that we're saying you have to consider your rules, then we sit with organizations. We do a diagnostic of what challenges that they're facing. And then based on the challenges that they highlight to us, we might say, okay, it's in your best interest probably to pursue this area if you're looking for gig workers, or perhaps gig workers from this, um, within this set may not be, maybe more of a challenge to you. So perhaps you, prefer, you procure your gig workers here. But in terms of that rise of the blended workforce, it's not just those working on the platforms, but those working remotely who might be full-time with the company, those working remotely who might be independent as well, and, and that sort of dynamic mix. Yeah, and I think it'll be industry specific as well, right? So different industries Absolutely. will have their own challenges around that. Um, yeah. And I see, as Especially I said, I see want your parietal work going. So I think HR can be outsourced <laughs> to gig economies. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, support functions can be outsourced, but wherever there is uh, anything, anything to do with employee privacy, employee data rights, yeah. uh, will we'll need to get a little more, uh, Absolutely. There has to be more attention to that. Yeah. 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 One of the things that we've advised as well is for, um, gig workers or independent workers to sit down with companies and go over the terms and conditions before actually beginning the work to see, to highlight those barriers from the very beginning. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it, Pallavi, you mentioned it correctly because as I heard the two of you, I kept thinking that maybe the gig rules are easier for certain industry and not for the others, right? So maybe a uh, gig will kind of form, uh, you know, shape faster in some industries and other industries where, you know, the lot of confidentiality, privacy and encryption and all that sort of stuff is required, for maybe. Example, banking won't. Banking is one totally. sector which has, has to have so much of protection and they're kind of, even with legitimate companies, you know, and, and providing all this, they still are very, they, they like their captive, the captive companies, right, which are kind of sitting inside their own framework and they can govern everything that's going on. So they, yeah. they're not open even to, you know, out giving it to big, big companies, even like ours or anyone else. Uh, so yes, that's a sector that is not likely to open up very soon, but yes, others will, others will. Yeah. Most definitely. Now we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to kind of uh, ask our audience one more time if they had any questions, uh, we can ask for them. Um, Ricky, you've turned your camera on. I'm assuming uh, you have a I question. I have a question. I have a question here from Palavi and like, actually everyone, including Palavi as well. But I think one of the things that I noticed, and also maybe this is more of a hypothesis that I have based on my very limited observation is that uh, you know the blended workforce model, when we think about a gig economy, I think a lot of times we think about Upwork freelancer.com where it's actually a marketplace model you hire anyone you want and they work for you for one project and that's it but from the sound of it right Palavi you mentioned that you know like confidentiality is a big issue you know compliance is a big issue well do you see a trend uh, of you know a more private type of you know like a network that these companies will start to kind of like grow and develop uh, as you know the blended workforce becomes more common yeah, I, I personally, you know, one of the trends that I, uh, and we don't know if it's going to happen is uh, we'll probably start to see uh, some kind of a unionization of gig workers, uh, which kind of, if you see, you'll, you'll see that uh, with Uber and, and, you know, all the, these are all gig economy workers, right? But there are some kind of uh, associations or unions that come together. So uh, because it's difficult for any company and I don't know how it will happen going forward that a company will have like you know 20,000 contracts with 20,000 gig workers so it's it's going to be just way too cumbersome for the kind of value that you might get out of that and the cost benefit analysis may not actually uh, give you that benefit so it, it is better and and so I think it would uh, it would happen through a freelance.com. It will happen through some agency, some delivery vehicle through which the gig workers would come in and somewhere that delivery vehicle, that organization or a vendor or whoever you may call it, a union, 
uh, will kind of become the negotiating body at some point because I, I think one of the challenges is that you, if you want 20,000 gig workers, we are a company that employs, even today we have over 80,000 gig workers, by the way. So just globally, right? We are more than three, uh, 300, 340,000 regular employees uh, in 170 countries. And we have about 75, 80,000 that are on contracts. So we do have, but we have them through our vendors, obviously. We do have maybe 10, 15,000 that are individual contracts. But that goes through like a painful process. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. So I don't, I think that's going to be the challenge and which is why I think there's going to be some kind of an organization or a delivery vehicle that needs to come together to make this happen for gig workers. Until such time, it will be a very ad hoc approach for most industries. That That's how I see it for now. Things might change depending on how we, how, you know, and this is again, a, a a movement where governments need to come in, policymakers need to come in, unions need to come in. So it won't be that simple, like yeah. a simple employer contract that we have. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, Pallavi, I can uh, speak to that. I think it's not for the faint hearted, you know, and again, um, your, I mean, Sanofi employs a lot of people previously from IBM because we were setting up a HR shared services. I think you would know very well your HR shared services is over in Dalian, yes. you know, of course, uh, in India as well. You know, our previous HR came from there as well. We have a whole gamut of IBM, uh, you know, they join us. I think we have to look at uh, a couple of perspectives, right? Uh, first of all, is to address your consideration about number one, we have to find similar time zones. It doesn't work, you know, if you don't have the same time zones, right? And if it is a transactional activity that requires very little engagement with people, for example, HR shared services that we have, uh, you know, in Italian, for example, they just ma manage all the manual work, right? For example, from invoice to bills, uh, you know, and, and claims and so forth. So those transactional activities then is defined as tier one. All right. So as we go about itself, you know, to the gig economy, even for the gig economy, there are many tiers as well. So you need to define the tiers. Deloitte actually defined this sort of project for us. So you have tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and tier five. So tier five will really be um, the very premium, very difficult niche, uh, you know, competencies you're looking for. So tier one will be considered something that is very basic, fundamental that you can outsource. So when you outsource that itself, you must have volume, you know, uh, certain, so it depends on volume or its niche, right, in terms of the role. And number two, you have to look at the function. So if the function has to be practical enough to be outsourced. Uh, I think, Pallavi, uh, you can speak to uh, the joy, right, of talking to the regulations, you know, the security. I want to add on procurement. Um, yes. It's also one of the most... Um, <laughs> Our interesting partners, right? Uh, I, I know for sure, you know, because we have a lot of interesting partners like procurement because they will tell you all the legality that is known. And to ma many a times itself, it depends on the maturity of the organization. So overall, it depends on the strategy of the organization. If the organization strategy is to have, for example, uh, I call it like a 70-20-10 rule. Some organizations would say that I would have 70% in terms of FTE right, 20% in terms of flexible workers, 10% in terms of short term, all right, so it depends on how they define the workforce planning in terms of the overall strategy. Some organizations are smaller, they can't do that, so they go on short term contracts and all that. They don't have so much, uh, I would say, nuances in terms of uh, the negotiation, but practically for any listed company to engage, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the gig workforce, uh, you know, the flexible workforce, you call it independent workers whatsoever, regulation, security, uh, procurement, uh, your compliance, your legal, they are your friends within your stakeholder management. And so Pallavi, I can shake hand with you because they are all our friends, right? <laughs> you know, you, you have to love them because they will give you all the barriers to tell you, oh, legally, this is not Absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah. right. You know, so I'm we gonna that. You cannot escape that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to just just ask one more time from our audience if there's any more questions. We we have you all here. I want to make sure they've got the answers to your question. Ricky, did you get the answer to your question? You did. Okay, he's nodding his head. Um, anybody else has any other questions for for the speakers here? Well, in that case, we are going to wrap up today. So. Thank you all and what a lovely discussion and a lovely conversation. 
I certainly got to learn a lot, but I'm leaving with one big question in my head, which I'm sure as time, time goes by, I will have an answer to. Every organization that I go to work with, their biggest challenge to solve right now is how do we motivate our people? And the human resources has been trying to figure that out for how many years? I am just wondering how human resources is going to do that with such a dynamic workforce moving forward, with such a, you know, homogeneous workforce, which is full-time employees we've struggled with such a long time. It'll be interesting to see how, as time goes by, we will figure out uh, motivation levels for this dynamic workforce. But I'm sure uh, the answers will be there. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Annie. Many thanks, Pallavi, for being like you are a part of Keynote and joining in and answering some of the questions. It was lovely to have you here with us. Thank you, Keynote. Thank you, Binu, for organizing all of this. Um, I will wrap up this evening and we look forward to seeing some of you back here again for our next session, which will be on the 28th of July. We will share the topic and what we are discussing very soon on our social media platforms. Thank you very much once again and have a lovely evening.